Okay, welcome to the South Sound User Group. Uh, we're gonna uh, hand it over to Matt Lee today uh, to do digital art. Hey, um, so um, let's see, I don't know, I guess I should probably share my screen with y'all. That would probably help. And yeah. So for those who don't know me, my name is Matthew Wyan. Um, I am relatively new to Olympia. Um, and this is my first time presenting with the group. This is a topic that I have talked about in um, at the closure group in Portland a few times before I moved. And my examples here are all in JavaScript because I figured that um, not having the overhead of one enclosure along with it would be uh, would make understanding some of the concepts a lot easier. I have um, a lot of uh, some HTML files and some JavaScript files that are up on um, GitHub. I posted the link in the Meetups channel in Slack. And you can download this and play along if you want, look through the code if you don't see anything. Um, if there's any issue with reading my screen, please let me know so that I can um, uh, bump the font size up or whatever. What font are you using? It's called Dank Mono. It is payware, but I like it, so, yeah. Um, and I have a number of different examples here that I'm just going to comment and uncomment and um, start plowing through some things. Um, basically iterating, uh, iterating over four different pieces, four different ideas to kind of show off a couple of different modes for processing, or well, in this case, P5JS. Um, processing being a couple of different implementations of the same library uh, for doing all sorts of things that you might consider creative coding. Um, you can do drawing, you can do some audio related stuff with it, you can do animation, you can interact with, uh, with the user through the mouse or through other stuff as well. And um, it has a very vibrant community. It's been around for a very long time. It started off in Java land. Uh, P5.js is the JavaScript version. There's a Python version of the library as well. Um, and my approach to this as somebody who studied art in college and has uh, continued with painting and photography and printmaking ever since um, is largely in the realm of two-dimensional art. But I want to show off a couple of things with animation and some of the 3D stuff as well, just because I think it's interesting and can tie into some ideas around math. Um, so this is a very kind of simple, simplistic attempt at making a landscape image in processing. Um, it is entirely deterministic, there's no randomness to it at all. Um, it's in this file, um, landscape one deterministic JS. And um, it is, three parts with a draw loop that gets set up. Oh, um, I, I real quick also want to go over my little harness that I have uh, here for these, what they call sketches. There's a setup that gets run once when the sketch loads. Um, in this particular case, I want to use this library called Chroma that um, I use for dealing with color. If you need to deal with uh, color programmatically in JavaScript at all. I highly recommend Chroma. Um, furthermore, I'm also using the um, Hue Chroma Whiteness or, well, white, uh, HCL and LCH are synonymous. They're, um, it's a color space that maps how people see, how humans perceive color as opposed to how computers render color or how ink uh, displays on a page. And um, I find it to be the it takes a little bit more effort to understand, but once you do, I find it to be much more intuitive for um, dealing with, oh, I'm going to make some change to a color and I want to understand how that works. So I picked out a couple colors and um, started with a little bit of a base. I have three layers here and I'm gonna go through them all um, pretty quickly. The first is um, this sky, which is a fairly simple triangle pattern. There is um, not a lot going on here. The code mostly fits on one screen and it's only this long because I wanted to make it a little bit clearer to understand. Um, I have an area here where, let's see, what do I, do I my columns? I'm gonna set my columns to zero real quick. Um, actually, 
not using my regular keyboard too, so I'm maybe a little bit off. Um, I fill in my, I have a background area. I'm filling it in um, really quickly just to, for debugging purposes, it helps me understand, oh, hey, where's this area that I'm going to set? I have, I started off by saying, okay, my area here is, um, I have in, in my support uh, file, just the definition of width and height, or W and H, just to be a, a, a thousand pixel square canvas. And um, I'm saying here that I want to take the top two thirds of it roughly, and or not roughly, exactly the top two thirds of it, and then um, I'm buffering the sides by about 50 pixels on either side. And I wanted to draw some triangles. I figured that might make for an interesting sky. Um, so I decided to make a grid. Uh, in this particular case, I just arrived at these num I, I started with some other numbers and then arrived at these two particular numbers because I thought it looked nice. Um, I do a little bit of math to figure out my sizes. And if you don't like math, um, I'm sorry, but there's gonna be a, a lot of like really basic math involved in some of this. Um, and then start basically iterating over my columns and rows. Um, set up our, a phase in this particular case it's this is more of a percentage um, than a phase but how far through the column are we how far through the row are or how far you know across are we with the columns how far down are we with the rows and then I use that to um, in this particular case start um, I need to turn off these tooltips can I turn off my tooltips I cannot turn off my tooltips okay well that's annoying um, I do a few things here where I am manipulating, using those in what is, what was fundamentally an arbitrary, um, manner to, um, effectively modulate some portion of it. I'm either changing the color of, um, the sky, I should say this to get my triangles back. I'm changing the color of uh, the triangle that I'm going to draw based on the position of it in, ac across the canvas so that it's, you know, not just some basic single color across the entire thing. Um, I, processing provides a number of, uh, in the way that I'm using it, at least a number of global level um, functions for doing things like computing the sine and cosine of things. Uh, it gives you some constants around pi and, and whatnot. And um, if you get into the trigonomic stuff, uh, pi and tau and whatnot become incredibly useful. And it has a, a couple of um, functions for just transforming numbers and making sure that they stay within a particular range or taking one range of numbers and transforming them to another range. And map is, is one of those. Um, I'm modifying my, my chroma color here to make it a little, to vary the whiteness and to vary the hue. Um, and I'm filling in, up, setting my fill. And then I'm figuring out what, where the position of the triangle is. And in this particular case, it's just simply, determining if I'm in an odd, if I'm in an even column, then it is a downward triangle. If I'm in an odd column, it's an upright triangle, or maybe it's the other way around. Um, and I mean, this is, I don't know, it, it's not terribly complex math, but it's just figuring out where are the particular points for the triangle. Um, there's nothing terribly interesting going on here, but it, it I think is illustrative of, of how to draw a shape and how to make a little bit of in particular, how to draw a pattern of shapes. Um, if I wanted to make maybe a little bit more variance in here, I could set my um, whiteness to more like full pie and I'd get a much more dramatic um, change in my sky. Um, after that, I wanted to look at the ground and I consider this the bottommost layer, but this is, it looks like there's a lot going on here, but it's fundamentally the same idea. I have, um, I have two grids um, and I'll iterate through those real quick. Where um, the first thing that I have going on is just a couple of, a little bit of uh, variance in this background color to the brown to give it a little bit more detail, a little bit more variance, a little bit more interest. Um, and this is one of the things that is kind of important to art in general um, 
there is, uh, in the 60s, there was a modernist painter named Mark Rothko who would take these uh, really large canvases and put uh, just a single field uh, or of like one color or two colors on there. And they'd be 10 feet tall, eight feet wide, whatnot. And they were massive, but they weren't consistent. It wasn't solid. There was the, the texture of the canvas would come through, the texture of the strokes would come through. And I've seen them in person and they are amazing. The photographs don't really show what it is at all, but the variance in, in that along with the size, which uh, you could argue if it's not good, make it big. But regardless, it, it, was, it was quite an experience being in front of that. And so one of the things that, that um, I think makes for interesting images is for having just some little things come through. So my first little loop here is making, taking my brown, um, also varying the whiteness, using some more of this, uh, the sign function again, to do a little bit of variance inside of this area down here for the ground that I set up to say, oh, okay, I'm going to draw a couple more rectangles. And as you can see, they're very obviously on a sign pattern. Um, after that, I wanted to make the, um, the, the grass, so to speak. And this is also fairly straightforward. Um, if I comment out my initial modulation, you can see that it's just a grid. And if I, um, let's see here. Is one comment out that one and um, this one's not done in the same manner as the other ones. I get rid of the color modulation, it's all starting with basically a grid of green squares. And um, what I am doing as I'm going through this grid is effectively just changing up the colors a little bit and changing up the position a little bit. And this is not terribly complex stuff. It's just looking at it, taking a little bit of, this was done to taste, but deciding, okay, I'm going to vary the whiteness of each particular thing just a little bit somehow as we go through. This is, um, these values were chosen kind of arbitrarily. It is a little bit more complex in that I'm taking the Y, you know, the, the Y column in my grid or the Y position in my grid and the Y, uh, the X position in my grid, doing a little bit of um, cross modulation and a couple of trigonomic functions, but it's just adding up some complex behavior. If I wanted to, I could make this a lot more simple. And yes, that didn't really work. Okay. Well. I don't know why that's not working, but um, similarly, I thought it would be fun to um, modulate the, uh, what is in LCH terminology called the chromasticity. I'm uh, having issues with the Wi-Fi again. Nope. Oh. Okay, I have an error in my code here. This is the danger of life coding. What's going on? Alpha. No. JavaScript. This one isn't quite as obvious, but you can see that it starts getting into um, maybe a little bit less chromatic, or in this case, more chromatic, and it veers into purple. Um, because this is one of the, the things that is perhaps a little bit unintuitive about um, the LCH color space is um, there's no such thing as a super bright olive green. Um, and 
in, in that particular case, it, it, rather than resulting in an invalid color, it just decides to bend it towards purple when it gets too, too bright. Um, and then I also um, thought it'd be fun to modulate the um, opacity of this a little bit too. Um, aside from that, let's see here. After that, I also wanted to modulate the um, height and width of each of the rectangles. This is a fairly simple modulation based on the cosine. Um, and then if I do the same thing with the width, I get something approaching more of a pattern. Um, but if I were to instead make something, again, with a little bit more complex modulation where I have something of a, a cross between multiple parameters, then um, some more interesting behaviors might emerge. And in this particular case, I have some, it's all the same color right now, so you can't tell, but there's, the squares are overlapping in um, a lot of different ways. And when I bring back the alpha modulation so that they're not all the same, you can see that they kind of start to add up a little bit and it forms a, a, a texture for the grass. And then I bring back my other modulations and, um, you know, I, I, you could pretend that this, these are flowers down here and that you've got some grass on a field. Um, after that, the other thing that I had, and this is, again, this is a little bit more about drawing, a little bit more about um, looking at color and ways to vary some things over time. And then once I get through that, I also have the clouds. And these are um, drawing with Bezier curves, actually not even Bezier curves, they're a, a different type of curve. I think they're ecliptic curves, um, which are much simpler conceptually than Bezier curves, but they don't give you as nice control. And um, here I just decided I wanted 20 clouds, and this is a case where I'm iterating through a loop. I'm not going to go into as much detail with this code. You know, again, I have some things where I am, um, my variable names are terrible here. Um, one of the fun things about working on, on code for fun is that you don't have to worry about coming back to it in six months. Um, you know, I have a nomenclature for myself of, of typically uh, setting with local Y for a particular coordinate inside of a loop. And then I have like start X for things that I know I'm going to be building off of. In this particular case, after I determine the color of the cloud and where I'm going to, where the cloud particularly starts um, along this series, uh, then I have to, I start drawing a shape. Um, I set down two, uh, for setting and ending a, a shape to connect, you kind of have to do the same coordinate twice. And then um, I, rather than doing a, a for loop with a set number of coordinates, I just decide to start walking over to the side here. And it walks over to the side in a sort of another sort of modulated pattern. Um, and at just stepping some, direct, some amount forward um, after drawing the point. And it keeps doing that until it gets over to the, uh, to the side. And once it's there, it draws two points to kind of anchor the cloud on the side. And then it starts walking back. And for the walk back, I just decided to have the height vary a lot less and to make, take longer steps so that it would look a little bit more like a real cloud. I mean, you know, it's not perfect, but it's kind of the impression of a cloud. And that, I think, is more the point. Um, that piece is entirely deterministic. There's no randomness in here. And the reason why I wanted to highlight that and the reason why I wanted to go through a piece without any randomness is um, because I think a lot of people, when they hear generative art, they start thinking, oh, it's just, it's randomly generated. And so I took the same, effectively the same code. And um, this is a random landscape using the same, effectively the same thing, where I went in and dropped in some Oh, hold on. No, go away. Okay. Is this, this is right. Okay. The Zoom uh, share thing came down. Um, this is the same, effectively the same code here. But um, if I, every time I reload it, it will give me something entirely different. And sometimes I like it and sometimes I don't. Most of the time I don't. Um, 
what I view the role of randomness in art making is kind of more of a curation and inspiration process. There's a lot, there's, I think there's some really neat things going on with the texture down here that I have, I have no idea what the pattern is that, that created that. Um, if I were so interested, I could, um, I could take the random seed that um, is set in my harness. I have it actually logging to the console every time. And I can recreate the entire piece from that and actually like have it output the data that uh, was used to, uh, to generate. Um, I view it more as a, as a, like a col kind of a way of finding inspiration and a way of surprising myself with what's happening from the, um, from the code. You know, I, I might never have particularly come up with this way of drawing grass, but I don't know, I like it. Or maybe I like this, uh, this, this brown wheat field instead. Um, if you're familiar with the painter, Bob Ross, he had a, uh, a term that has, at least I, I first encountered it in, in college when I was studying art called uh, the happy accident, where I didn't mean to do that, but I liked what happened. And I view randomness as a way of getting a lot of uh, a lot more happy accidents. So I have the I have the same fundamental draw loop. Um, I'm going to go through these again real quickly. These are the same functions that have been modified a little bit, but rather than um, having my constants in here, um, have and this is going to vary every time. I decide to generate um, my column count, my row count by um, using one of processing's functions for generating random numbers. This is a random Gaussian, uh, which is considered the normal distribution. If you've heard of, you know, you, if you know what a bell curve is, that's the normal distribution. Um, I'm giving it two parameters here that has defaults, but this first one is what the standard, no, what the mean is. So where the center of the random numbers come in. And then the second number is the standard distribution. Um, if you've taken statistics, you know what the standard distribution is. If you haven't, what this determines is how spread out the bell curve of the numbers are compared to um, what they might otherwise be. The default is to have a mean of zero and the standard deviation of one. So roughly 68% of your numbers that come out of that would be between negative one and one. Um, in the Java version of processing, at least, the Gaussian random number distributor will put out negative infinity and infinity, which are not good values to feed into things like for loops. So um, I also, and I don't know if the JavaScript version does this, I also want positive numbers and I also don't want it to get too high because I am going to run this through a for loop. You know, I, if I come out with a million, which is theoretically possible from this, um, I don't want it to do that. So I'm using its constraint function to effectively set the minimum and maximum values. I do that for my rows and my columns. I'm also setting up um, some values for the, mod the modulation of the lightness and chromaticity and color of the individual triangles. Um, and here, rather than using um, the chroma.js's uh, functions for manipulating a particular color, I am taking, um, I'm generating the color from its uh, lightness, chromaticity, and hue values outright, and um, doing the modulation before um, before the color is generated. Putting that um, putting that color value into into the fill and drawing my triangle again, um, pretty much as normal. There's no randomness to the position of the triangles. Um, Coming back to the ground, um, here I decided, oh, and for the, the sky, I decided, okay, well, I'm gonna just draw it across the entire background. For the ground, I thought, oh, well, it would be fun to have the ground take up some random amount of height between half to a fifth of the image. Um, and so that's what it's doing here. Um, Again, I decided to just pick out some base values at random for modulating things like what the background is. So if I set, let's see here. No. Um, you 
if I don't draw my foreground, it doesn't like that. All right, I don't know what's going on with that. Probably some JavaScript bug. I, oh, and now it doesn't work at all. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, yep, yeah, okay. It's the comment on there. Right there, yeah, okay. One of my favorite things about the closure language is it has a um, thing that just comments out the next thing, whatever the next thing is, not this particular line. Um, and I had a hotkey for that. But okay, so I think now that just opened up. Comment that out again. Um, now I'm not drawing the grid anymore uh, of the grass. I'm just drawing what is effectively the dirt. And here the, desert, the dirt decided to be pink. And my little patches um, decided to have, what's going on here? I guess, yeah, I'm using a little bit of uh, this thing. Input scalar is just a helper function I wrote to take the random Gaussian value and run it through um, a modulation function. In this particular case, um, my modulators is just an array of, you know, maybe this is a sign. It's something that takes a value between, um, uh, a, a value that is measured in radians and uh, where, of which tau would be one radian and return a value between negative one and one. Um, and this is something that I, um, I, I also do a lot with um, synthesizers and modular synthesis and sound design. And this is a concept that comes up a lot is, taking signals and modulating them somehow. Um, and so if you know, the sine wave is uh, kind of a pure tone in sound, and then this would be the equivalent of a square wave, um, I think I had the equivalent in here of a, um, if I wanted to, I could put in a, an equivalent of a, of a triangle wave or just a simple ramp. I'm not gonna mess with that right now, but, um, these are ways of taking these values and kind of distorting them somehow to come up with with an in, with something that might be a little bit more interesting. And this is where, for me at least, a lot of the happy accidents arise. Is I never would have thought of um, maybe running this through a you know running a, the value a through a sine wave and value b through a, a simple like a, a maximizer effectively, but. Um, the, it, it could come up occasionally if I let it choose functions um, at random here to um, do my modulation for me to to do that distortion. Anyway, I'm running that um, using all that to determine where my start and uh, or where where my y position is, my vertical position, um, and set my colors, um, and then come back here and do a lot more setup here for just figuring out what my modulation looks like on my grid. Um, the actual code is, I, I guess this isn't as, it's not super straightforward. This is more or less a port of the previous thing where um, I'm taking the first, you know, two values that are being modulated and um, I'm, at doing uh, some multiplication here and some addition here to get some, um, you know, slightly nonlinear results. If I, I think if I were to just comment this out and comment this out, it would be a little less chaotic. Yeah, that looks a little bit more like a pattern. I reloaded a few times. A little bit more of an obvious pattern. Let's see. I think. Um, and if I were to say comment that out and just have this be, you know, if I go back to some sort of deterministic thing, you can see the sine wave in there a little bit. Maybe if I were to multiply that by, let's say, 10. Oh, this is for the whiteness. Yeah, it's a lot more obvious there. Um, I do all this just to set the color because for me, that's where a lot of the 
the interest it came from is just seeing where the how the variations in the color came through, um, how the how that texture played out. There was um, also set up a little bit of stuff to uh, vary the height and width of the squares as they would pass through as well. And this is um, similarly, I think, not that complicated. It's just taking a bunch of values and adding them together. And then, um, yeah, there's, okay. There's my actual um, values that I'm coming up with. I'm effectively just taking um, two modulation, fun picking two modulation functions at random and then a random number between, excuse me, uh, zero and one and a random number between zero and 10 and deciding, okay, I'm going to um, let this determine how wide this particular square is, how high it is. Um, and then I draw it. And this is um, simply my center X value, my center Y value to set the top uh, left of the rectangle and then um, draw that out based on its width and height. Um, the particular notion, oh, and then I did a little bit too with the, um, the squares. The particular notion of, of doing just modulation on squares alone is something that I have actually like spent a month uh, exploring because I came up with a lot of interesting variations, um, particularly when I started getting into letting, um, having the code randomly generate itself for doing that. Um, I have a few pieces up in the background that I can uh, show off a little bit later. Uh, the clouds, again, I have the same thing. I decided to choose a random number of clouds. So it'll end up somewhere between one and a thousand, but more likely between 15 and 20 uh, and 25. Um, I guess it would help if I bring the clouds back. Um, and again, just picking out some, what are effectively some static random numbers. These aren't going to change for the course, throughout the course of the loop. Um, I don't think I'm doing a whole lot here through the course of the loop. Rather, I'm picking out some base values and then using those alongside my um, my phase values as I'm stepping through it to decide how to how to draw the cloud. Um, in this particular case, I thought, oh, hey, maybe I could have some storm clouds, or um, I think it's actually ending up more as storm clouds. Oh, there we go. That oh, looks more like what our weather's been like recently. And uh, yeah. Um, and it's the, more or less the same thing here. Just walk there, walk back, and draw some points. Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of what I think the, the meat of two-dimensional drawing is, is you, you can make some shapes, you can make some, uh, make some lines. And if you learn how to do that, it'll go a long way. I follow a lot of artists on Instagram and um, the bulk of it is just people doing this stuff with interesting algorithms or interesting math behind it. Um, I wanted to go into a couple of other things that I'm not, that I don't personally um, spend a lot of time on, but um, I think are interesting nevertheless. Uh, the first of which is three-dimensional um, drawing in three dimensions. Um, I don't find this as interesting because, um, where is it, here we go. Uh, you have to know a lot of stuff to draw in three dimensions. In, in addition to simply like, thinking about how far away something is on the z-axis, you have to start worrying about things like lights and the camera. And um, you have to start worrying about reflectivity and materials. And um, honestly, I feel like if you were interested in doing some stuff with three-dimensional um, uh, artwork or, or whatnot, you might be better served by looking at 3JS instead of processing. It's got a much more mature community and facilities for doing things like rendering with shadows or rendering with um, focal depth. So that as they, it, you know, when you have a light and something is in the way of the light, it casts a shadow. And when something is far away from the item that's in focus, it's blurred. You can't do that in processing. Um, but this is a, a fairly simple a, thing that I wanted to explore where I have, um, a, a circle on the bottom and a whole bunch of rectangles coming up out of the top. I wanted to see if it would come up with something interesting. And um, I decided 
playing into the randomness a little bit more, um, I decided to vary the colors just a little bit. I chose one color at the beginning and um, decided to, um, well, I'll, I'll walk through this, this whole mess of a function here without the camera at first, but I set out some lights. Um, this particular piece is oriented along the z-axis, which is, you can't see it, is going effectively from the camera down to the bottom. These circles um, at the back are just something I decided to put in so that I wouldn't have any particular um, black background. I wanted to have some, some better, bit of color behind all the, the foregrounds type stuff. Um, I found drawing in 3D, to, uh, particularly with the, the JavaScript version of processing, to be um, rather tedious and painful. You have to do a lot of um, moving the uh, particular point around and its relative. Um, if you don't want to have to track your relativity, you can use the push and pop functions to effectively say, you know, I, my rotation is uh, not there. My translation is, is not there anymore. Just, you know, throw that all away. Um, let's see if I set this back to, let's say zero. Um, we get just the cylinders this time. This is um, taking my base color, I'm making it a little bit, um, as I step through it six times, I think, it's make, getting a little bit dimmer each time and a little bit less uh, saturated each time. I'm putting it a little bit further in the background because processing, uh, and th this is the same for 2D. The th as, as things draw, they um, will overwrite anything that is currently there. And so for three dimensions, you need to take that into account by, by having depth. So I want the later cylinders to be behind. And I do that by just setting them slightly, um, slightly behind. Um, the draw function, um, typically for debugging purposes, I find it, uh, particularly with the loops, if I'm going to have a, a large number of things, I find it easy to have some low value where I can get some instant feedback on what this is, what a particular thing is doing, so I don't have to wait for potentially 100,000 uh, things to draw. It lets me iterate on something pretty quickly. Um, but otherwise, for a full piece, I might want to look at this and see how, um, how many of these are, I'm going to have. Um, this is the same idea as before. This time, instead of using the um, the Gaussian or otherwise straight up random random numbers, I'm using um, a thing that a, a randomness function that uh, is built into processing called Perlin noise, and it's available through this simple noise function, which takes one to three parameters representing an x, y, and z coordinate. And the idea behind Perlin noise is that it produces something naturally consistent. The um, it kind of might, it might form a topography um, of sorts. And I think the, um, the reference doc, oh, I have the reference over here. The reference for the noise functions are um, a lot more illustrative of this. As a value changes, the, um, this is an example of, of two-dimensional Perlin noise, I think maybe with a, yeah, a little bit of, it has a little bit of a third dimension going on here, I think, but no, just two. But as a value changes, the um, values that come out of the noise function change gradually. And this is very, very useful if you want to generate a contour without having to come up with an algorithm. I could have actually used this to do the clouds in the previous uh, piece. Um, and so here I'm effectively coming up with a lot of intermediate values that I can use further on down the line before I start coming up with things. I decided to play around a little bit with reflectivity for the materials and for the, um, for the colors. So some of these things will, uh, this is an example of what processing calls an, an emissive material. And this would be an example of um, what it calls a specular material. And that, defend, that, that just describes how it um, reflects light. Um, I think, let's see, where is my color stuff? If I set this just to a static value, it's a little bit more, so I'll set this to zero. So everything will have the same color now. 
um, might be a little bit easier to, to understand. This in particular is a, um, an emissive material. It has a sort of glow to it, whereas this is a specular material in that it kind of reacts to the light that's hitting it. Um, since I set the color to static, the whites are all the same color as well. Um, and I guess I can, well, here, hold on a sec. So go back down here. This is a fairly simple thing where I'm using the noise functions to generate a couple of random numbers to represent the color and the position of the um, particular rectangle that I'm going to draw um, down here with box. Um, I also decided to rotate them a little bit too because I thought it would be fun. Um, add a little bit more, more interest, so to speak. Um, if I bring back a lot of them, the textures that can occur are kind of fun sometimes. Um, this is, it can take a few seconds to draw. And these were, you know, I, I didn't have any rhyme or reason when putting these values in. Um, normally in, in my own work, I will um, have a, a sort of a code generator that will pick a particular noise function, or maybe it will use another another random function or whatnot, and it will also randomly choose the parameters out of some uh, of some parameter space for a particular point in a grid, or for a particular point in a three dimensional grid, or, or, or a particular series. It will generate like what is my percentage through the thing? What does that look like as um, a couple of other numbers? And it will use those to latch on to as a way of saying this is what I'm going to use to to modify my values. Um, there's, I don't know, let's see here, if I turn off the um, materials type stuff, it gets a, not quite as interesting, but you can see that it's just the rectangles at this point, and um, we have our whiteness variation. If I set this to straight up, um, let's say 50, I'll set this to 50. So I have some room. Ah, that's actually, I like that. A little bit more um, kind of a, you know, it's just, it's a uniform color, but with, or a uniform whiteness and uh, tone, I guess, between the, um, the whiteness and the chromasticity, but the hue is changing. Um, these are, this process that, that, that I have, and that I think that a lot of people who play with this stuff uh, have is, it's very iterative. Um, you just kind of want to change some things here and there and kind of see what, what works, what you like. And um, the work that I do in, in Clojure, at least with the code generation, is um, also of that nature to kind of see like, oh, well, you know, I never would have thought of doing that, but I like what it, what it does. Um, getting back to my idea of using randomness as um, a sort of happy accident generator. <sighs> Um, in three dimensions, you also have to worry about light. Um, processing gives you a couple different lights. You can set an ambient light um, to, let's see here, if I set this to zero real quick, um, I have only the ambient light and um, no other lights that come through here. It has, a, a, I think, a fairly flat look to it, but it can be kind of fun. Um, I also use what I'm using here, what it calls a point light, which is a you just you set a point in three-dimensional space and then it just emits light of that color in directions. It doesn't cast any shadows, um, but it just emits light and will light up whatever surface it hits kind of based on the angle of that surface to the light hitting it. Um, at least, you know, it does this for you and so you don't have to do any of the math. Um, you only get five point lights in a particular scene. It also has directional lights, which I'm not using here, and you can only have five of those in a particular scene, so you have to use them very judiciously. Um, and I like using them just because I feel like they, you know, here it's putting them up on the top. If I didn't, uh, maybe if I didn't have them uh, spaced quite so far apart on my z-axis coming forward, maybe they wouldn't shine on the top quite so much. Yeah. And so there it's kind of lighting things up in the middle. It might be hard to see in some of these, but. Um, and again, I'm choosing, using some randomness 
uh, a little bit to choose my um, X, Y positions and the color of the white. Um, you also have, you can have a little bit of fun with the camera here. I um, thought it might be fun to angle my camera a little bit so that I can see the things from a little bit more dramatic angle. Um, I'm using this to move the camera around. If I were to simply change the angle of the camera and not um, look, then it had too much of a possibility of just looking off into nothingness. Uh, at least in my initial playthroughs. Here, I don't know, I guess it's working. Maybe I, that, maybe I got a dial in. Um, you have a little bit of uh, ability to play around with the uh, uh, field of view. So rather than um, 60 degrees as my field of view, I'm setting it here to almost 180 degrees. Um, in playing around with this, I didn't get anything really useful out of um, more than 180 degrees or more. It wouldn't, it wouldn't render anything uh, about that in any coherent form. Um, I played around a little bit with a random um, field of view generator. And I also here decided that if, um, I wanted to move the camera a little bit too to compensate for my field of view. It just, I don't know, it looked a little bit weird if I didn't do that. But and on the other hand, maybe. Um, it's one of those things where um, you, you kind of learn what's there, you learn how to play with it, and then you just discover what you like. The other thing that is um, fun to play with is um, the orthogonal camera. And um, this is, it doesn't render perspective. Um, I think if I set my angle a little bit differently, it becomes a little bit more apparent here. There's no, um, there's no uh, shrinking of the things as it goes into the distance. And this, um, it, it, it might look a little bit, make things look more like they were in a kind of older uh, video game. Uh, where I had a sort of top-down perspective, but everything, there was no perspective. You just had your grids and your columns. Um, this is, I, I actually kind of like uh, playing around with things in orthogonal perspective because it's much more apparent, I think, where things are going to appear in the camera. Um, otherwise, I found three dimensions just hard to work with and a little bit unpredictable. Hmm. Um, another thing that, um, is uh, a lot of people like to play with, and um, I found uh, it gets some interesting results. It's called pixel sorting. Um, and so processing gives you the ability to load up some images and um, put them into a buffer and play with them. And um, let's see here. I have an image of a kitten. Somewhere, really, really find her. So I have this image of a kitten that I got off of placekitten.com or IO or whatever it is. Um, and I wanted one that was about a third of, about two thirds of my canvas wide. Um, and I'm loading it up in a buffer. When the buffer is ready, I um, get its pixels and uh, create a new, a new image. And I start effectively just going through every pix every row here and um, get a subarray of the, um, out of the main, uh, of the row, out of the main uh, big array of, of pixels and decide to sort by uh, brightness here. I'm using, uh, I pulled in underscore, or not underscore, pulled in lodash.js um, just because doing sort by in JavaScript normally is something that is a pain in the ass. And um, there's a lot of uh, sequence processing in, in this particular thing. I decided to sort by brightness. Um, I'm chunking these by four, which means that I'm taking the individual um, numbers that are coming in and I'm putting them in slots of four for red, green, blue, and alpha values. Um, and then brightness will take those four value that are effectively that array of, of R, RGB and A and return the brightness as a single thing. So I'm sorting by that. 
Um, I also then, because my image is um, only about two thirds of the canvas, um, I'm taking the number of pixels that are left, copying that amount um, off of the, the side and then flipping them over to give a sort of mirror image here. It gives it, it, gives it some symmetry. Um, it puts the visual weight here, not at the edge of the canvas, but uh, somewhat in the middle. If uh, you've ever done uh, study photography at all, or, or you know, gotten much more more into um, trying to take nicer pictures, you've probably heard about the rule of thirds. And um, I, I consider it more of a suggestion, but I'm using it quite literally here, where you kind of want to keep the main focal point of your image um, at about. Uh, one of the third marks of um, your canvas or your, your frame. You want to put the, the thing that you're looking at um, or the, the, the main contrast barriers along a third axis or somewhat close to it because um, if it's in the middle, if it's too much in the middle, your image maybe might look a little bit too static. It might be seen too symmetric or too, too asymmetric. And if you put it um, too far over to the edge, then it's going to start feeling a little bit unweighted and out of balance. Um, I had a couple of different ways of playing um, with the sort. This is slow because I am effectively loading up 650,000 pixels and sorting through them. Um, looking at it by saturation instead of brightness gives a much more uh, glitchy kind of feeling to it. Um, I, I can look at red uh, just because I think that, you know, why, why not? Red in this particular case is strongly correlated to brightness in this image, but if I change it to blue, um, let's see what we get. Yeah, similar but different. Um, maybe a little bit more of a combination of um, the red and the brightness together. Um, this is a technique that I don't, I personally don't like playing with for my own artwork, but um, I do find kind of somewhat fascinating because um, it deals with doing sequence processing and I find that to be kind of fun. Um, so I took a second uh, stab at doing this where I have, um, I wanted to glitch it a little bit more. I wanted to take my um, basic sort of the pixels and um, have, Fun with it. So I decided to, the, the fundamental um, conceit of this is for each row, I'm going to sort them into chunks and these can be, here I'm using 100 pixels um, because it was, it proved just more aesthetically pleasing to me. So it's about a tenth of the image. And then I'm subsorting each chunk. Um, first I'm taking the entire row. Let's see if I close this out. Let's see. So I, if I don't sort those, you know, I have my initial um, sort by, um, this is, I thought it was sorting, but I guess it's not sorted, yeah, okay. Oh, it's all, here it is only chunking the underrun, that's interesting. Oh, entire, that might be a bug. Um, Let's see, I can sort by brightness instead. Or in this particular case, um, I'm loading up uh, CHR is a, just a simple function to take the RGB values out and construct a chroma.js uh, object from it. And from here, I'm getting the luminance, which is a measure of how much light the color is reflecting. Um, it's different from brightness because brightness is measuring how much energy is being used to render the color. Um, and one of the things about color that, that is not obvious is um, you, you, you don't have any such thing as like dim yellow, for example, or bright, like super bright purple. Um, those colors are, they're, they're, they're mathematically impossible. And um, yet like our RGB space kind of alludes to the idea that they are. Um, Luminance is more of a measure of how much light the, the color reflects, and so it, it is much more uh, accurate to what the eye sees as opposed to, okay, well, I'm gonna just bring this back real quick. 
we'll get our sub. Um, so this, this determines what the overall row is, and then the um, the individual. Am I, is this even being used? I guess it is. Let's see, saturation. I like this one. Let me see, I remember liking this one. Mm. Yeah, so this is sorting the entire, I think it's sorting the entire row first by how much color is there? No, it's not. Okay, well, something broke. Um, here I'm getting the actual, uh, again, the, this is the perceptual saturation. That's what chromasticity is. It's a measure of how much, uh, how much color the eye sees as opposed to gray. Okay, this is definitely um, doing the right thing here. Um, it, it's sorting from uh, the center on, uh, on over first, the, um, the, the colors by the, the chroma mirroring the thing and then um, dividing into chunks and then sorting each chunk individually. Um, I'm, in, I'm into the glitching stuff because one of the things that has interested me as an artist ever since I was doing this stuff in college and even somewhat before is looking at processes uh, that both introduce order and introduce decay. This one I really like but it's also really slow is um, is my view here? Uh oh, I'm, I'm actually like looking at where I am in my row, uh, what my uh, what my my row percentage. That's what that is. Yp. Mm -hmm. Get better naming. Looking at the uh, and then fading it between um, as we go down the image. It's it starts sorting by lightness at the top, and then as we go down to the bottom, it's sorting by by the chroma instead. And I really like how this turns out. It's also just really slow to render. Um. Let me go back to saturation real quick because it is quick. And then for the chunks, I decided to just have a couple different ways of playing around with it. Um, a lot of the exploratory process of art is just about asking what if. What if instead of sorting my chunks by um, hue, I'm going to look at whether or not they're before or after this, uh, this, this part of the underrun here, where if they're over here, it is considered in the underrun. And if it's over here, it's not. Um, what if instead I am sorting by one method on one side and, and the, another method on the other side? Um, you know, it, it now fades into glitch, sort of. Um, I think, let's see here. Here I am. Um, I, I'm sorting by a combination of the hue plus the whiteness and I have a memory of this being somewhat interesting. Let's see. No, okay. This one I did like. Um, this will fade between, uh, as you go across the, as, as the chunk goes across, it starts between fading in uh, by hue to fading by the, or to sorting by the opposite hue. And I kind of like how that came out. Um, another idea that I had that I thought was kind of interesting was to um, just mirror the internal chunks to introduce some symmetry. And this is just a. Uh, uh, as it goes through it, the right side of the array. Um, and I don't remember this being up. Okay, and then if I introduce one of these sorts, then I get something a little bit more glitchy. Okay, that's how that works. Okay. Yeah, here we go. This is um, taking the individual things and um, effectively just uh, making it look a little bit more mirrored. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I had a third idea to reduce the number of colors that were in there. Um, poster is just a simple function that uh, I wrote, where is it defined? Here it, um, it takes a, some sort of round value and um, 
will uh, round function and value and to kind of how many different chunks you wanted. And it will um, say for my whiteness, I'm going to reduce it to one of five steps. For my chroma, I'm introduced to one of 10 steps. And for my hue, I'm going to reduce it to one of um, 30 steps. Um, those are numbers I picked somewhat arbitrarily, but I like how it turned out. And again, this is kind of slow because it's dealing with a lot of pixels here. Um, which makes it, I don't know, makes it look a little bit, if I, let's see, if I don't do this, I don't do the subsorting, then it makes the, it, this is, if you've ever played with Photoshop, there's a filter called posterize. And so the word poster is taken from that, um, where the idea is that it just re reduces the number of colors that are available in the image. Um, oh, oh, okay, got to have a function in there. Can I bring this back? It should load soon. Oh, there we go. Hmm. Okay, well. Um, and then I had a, a fourth idea that I, I'm going to touch on just super quickly here, which um, this one is really slow. I'm just going to set it up to, um, to run real, real quickly and um, talk about it. What this does is it goes through the, um, the individual chunk. It pulls out the mean hue, the mean chroma, and the mean whiteness value for each, uh, for each chunk. Across each pixel, it pulls these out. This is, this is slow. It takes a while to do this because it's doing it a million times. Um, and then it is setting the hue to uh, in each of them to the average hue and setting chroma to uh, in each of them to the average chroma and then keeping the whiteness where it was. And I actually, I kind of like how this turned out. I mean, the, the purpling aside, it, um, it just, it, it takes the, the, the tone of the image and um, makes it more into something that I would want to, I, I could load this up and use it as a texture on a rect on a, another rectangle or a circle that I'm drawing. Um, and create some a little bit more interest that way. Um, I had a couple of other ways of like playing with this where um, maybe I'm reversing each individual chunk, but um, I feel like I'm starting to run out of time here, so I'm not going to go into that real quick. Um, the other thing that I had um, to go into was animation. And this is fairly straightforward, at least at first. Um, And this particular code is, um, I think, easy. The setup sets some um, some circles. I have an array of circles. I'm choosing a random number of them. Um, for each of them, I'm setting its index and um, a radius. Uh, the radius grows as it gets out, I think. Maybe, maybe not. yeah, the radius grows as it goes. Yeah, the radius grows as it goes out, um, and it grows by a random amount. Um, I'm setting up some oscillators for it, um, and oscillators. This is a term that I took from um, again from uh, synthesizers, but uh, and I was a lot more optimistic when I wrote this code. But um, what the, what this does is it says, okay, well, what is um, it takes a, a rough speed. It takes a maximum value that it should uh, that that speed should ever get to, and um, an offset, and returns a um, function that takes some functions. In this particular case, um, it's taking this sine function here, and the times function here. Um, and it runs these functions through um, through the modulation stuff. This is more akin to um, how I do things with my closure code, where I have a series of functions that do some modulation on a value, and um, it just runs through them all. So this gives me some primitives like multiplication, addition, uh, modulation, and, and uh, things like sign mapping or whatnot. Um, I'm using sign mapping, particularly or the sign function particularly as a, a sort of um, in animation what they would call an easing function so that rather than going from 
zero to one in a straight line, it starts off kind of slow, speeds up and then slows down as it gets to the end. And it gives it, I think, a more natural kind of breathing appearance. Um, I choose a lightness value at random. I choose, and um, what I do, I choose my, uh, I'm choosing how far away from the center it's going to be, both in angle and offset. These are also um, things that are modulated. Um, but the modulation is defined up front. And then um, in the draw function, so this is uh, every frame, 30 times a second, it goes through this, looks at each circle, um, decides to calculate the x and y from the radius of now. Um, I'm using a library here that is particularly around creating loops. And um, you can see now is, I was, oh no, now set up and draw. So I have um, now set um, calculating the position of what the radius should be now, what the angle is now, what the radius is uh, of the circle is now, um, doing a little bit of stuff on the um, lab is the, um, the sort of the cubic version of um, LCH where it is again uh, more of a perception color value. Um, but it, it, it rather, uh, it is lightness and then uh, an A and B axis that correspond to some sort of hue and uh, chromaticity value together. Um, and I just decided it would be a lot easier to um, work in because I'm de already dealing with the two dimensional, uh, like an XY space, Cartesian space, as opposed to a radial space. It would just be a lot easier to use the radial version of that. Um, and then I'm setting up my, uh, I'm set, setting that as my fill and I'm drawing an ellipse or, or a circle. Um, I don't remember why I decided not to draw a circle, but. And this will run forever um, because the values are all randomly generated. I don't think it will ever repeat. Um, and then I started getting into, well, what if I wanted to generate a GIF to be on the Instagrams? And, no, hold on, no. Mm -hmm. The zoom thing is coming down again and blocking the screen. So this one is um, the same idea, but rather than having the initial values be random, I decided to slow it down a little bit and use this um, library for P5 that um, pulls in uh, some facilities to do some smooth looping. I'm telling it that I want my loop to be 12 seconds. I'm setting up my, um, my randomness stuff again, but um, I think what I'm doing here, if I remember right. Okay, I have this. So that's floating through my loop. So it's still using the time to drive this, but um, rather, I forget what I get out of this particularly. It gives you, the, um, the, the loop library gives you some facilities for um, effectively taking um, a series of time and having some random, uh, divi some uniform divisions of it and some, some ways to generate smooth loops. So it gives you, some things like the, the concept of curl and noise, but that happens over time, for example. Um, here, I think I was just using it, oh, no, I don't know what I was doing. I was just using it to generate GIFs. Um, yeah, I had a thing for save GIF and it would download the GIF. Um, and um, this is the same idea, but this will, this will loop after 12 seconds. Um, it is, there's still randomness going on here and there will be every time I reload it, but after 12 seconds it will repeat. If I ratchet this down to, let's say, three seconds, that might become a lot more apparent. Um, the trouble with uh, having short loops like this though is um, things either have to go very fast or you can't have very, there's no, there are very few divisions of three that will perform a smooth loop. Like I can have one thing that goes at three seconds, and then one thing that goes at one and a half seconds, and then one thing that goes at one second. Um, but 12 is a nice number, I think, because there, it has a lot of um, divisors. 
that are that are whole numbers, and it's quite a while before you start getting into uh, other numbers. Um, here, I'm taking my my loop duration and I'm dividing. I think let's see, uh, um, I don't remember, but I think what I was doing. Oh no, okay, so the um, something with the the oscillator, I think, is using it. I don't remember specifically what was going on there, but. <sighs> This code is kind of old. The, oh, here we go. Um, it's taking the uh, the thing from the animation loop and actually um, yeah, it's using theta oscillator instead. So it's it's decoupled from time, but rather you, it's synced up to the, the internal clock of this loop that I have generating. And so the things will um, will will sync to to that clock as opposed to just the free running clock of the system. Um, I kind of like this, but it still seems a little bit too wild. And so for my final uh, piece, I wanted to uh, just show off something more akin to what like, I feel is representative of, of my work. This isn't glitching necessarily, but it is just breathing. Um, it's a loop. It's randomly generated, but um, just has these circles going in and out kind of slowly. Has a lot of alpha values stacked on top of each other with a little bit of hue variation. A little bit of whiteness variation, and um, just I really like the way that the color combinations play into each other, and how it kind of changes over time, and hopefully doesn't give anybody epilepsy or epileptic seizures. Um, and this is, I think, I just put more effort into modulating the color in this, and less effort into. The, it, I got rid of the um, the thing that was making the the circles rotate around the center as it was going through the loop. They just, they stay in one place and they just, um, they grow a little bit more slowly and they, they change their colors as things uh, progress. Um, and that's what I have for, for code. Um, I mentioned earlier that I have, uh, I did a whole series around exploring um, a grid of rectangles. And so I've got a bunch of things in here where, um, my initial sketches were dealing with black and white, and this is one that I particularly liked. Um, then I started getting into color, and at a friend, at one of my friends suggested, he wanted me to do a couple pieces for him using the solarized color palette. And so these four here are all actually the same algorithm. Um, the folder name is the uh, the Git SHA of the uh, of the code. Um, and I've actually like some of these, I, I did these over a year ago, and some of these I like I liked so much that uh, I had prints made of them. Um, not that one, but um, this one is uh, is one of my favorites, and it's I think probably about three thousand rectangles with varying degrees of opacity, and some sort of system that decided which rectangle is which color and what position it should be and how big it should be. Um, same algorithm, different seed. Same algorithm, different seed, and so on. Um, I've had a lot of fun with this. And uh, it, since I don't, I, I used to be into a form of uh, painting that involved blow torches and uh, chemicals and all sorts of things. And since I have a three-year-old and no space to do it now, um, I can't do that kind of painting anymore. And so this is kind of uh, helping scratch that itch. Um, and that's what I have for you. Uh, any questions? That was fantastic. Thanks. Let's direct questions into the meetups channel. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I can close that window. Get my laptop, my laptop span back. Are you hearing me? Yes. You mentioned yeah, that you uh, lock up too. do some work with closure. Are you using closure on top of processing for the similar things? Um, for the work that I was doing before, the one, uh, that stuff that I was showing, I was doing it on top of processing JS. Um, using particularly the, the library called Quill. Um, Quill also will front the, the P5.js uh, processing version of Clojure in Clojure script. 
And when, um, I, when I pick this up again, um, hopefully soon, um, I plan to do that. Not because I particularly like JavaScript or web browsers, but because I want to use the Chroma library for doing color manipulation. Um, and there's, I, I mean, one of the things that I like about the JVM is that it has a lot of libraries. It doesn't have any libraries for doing LCH color manipulations. Um, oh, somebody asked any physical media works you can show this started with us. Uh, I, let's see here. I can share that in the channel. Anyway, yeah, um, there's, there's not really any good libraries for doing color manipulation on the JVM, which really surprised me. And the, the trigonometry involved in um, converting between RGB, lab, and LCH is intense. Um, I, like, I, I, I consider myself as, as a programmer, somebody who can warn something enough to like, do something effective with it, but I'm not the, necessarily the sort of person that you might wanna trust to get the details of a particular fiddly little thing like absolutely exact. And so the thought of writing a color, uh, a color manipulation library uh, from scratch in, in Java just scares the shit out of me. <laughs> um, so uh, I uh, just thought, okay, well, you know, I can, uh, I can run P5 on node uh, headless effectively for large images um, when I want to generate my print quality type stuff. Um, and there are people who are doing that. And so um, it gives me, I mean, uh, the libraries are a little bit better too. It gives me just access to, I think, some, uh, some better libraries. Um, somebody asked in the channel if there's any physical media works I can share. Um, I've been making art of very, both um, painting and photography types since I was a teenager. Um, just off the top of my head, I'm going to a link to, um, I have an account that on 500px that I'm not really keeping up to date, but I have some of my landscape and um, photos and abstract photos on this. Um, and then I've been doing um, the, the, paint, the painting I was talking about with the blowtorch and chemicals and whatnot is a process called encaustics that uh, has originated in ancient Greece. Um, and I don't have a lot of photos of those readily available. They're kind of on external hard drives. Um, and I've given most of my paintings, I gave most of my paintings away when I moved, but um, it, uh, it involves dealing with wax, using wax as the medium for um, carrying the pigment. And one of the things that I like about working in encaustics is, um, let's see here, one of the things that I like about working in, in encaustics is how it lets you layer things. Um, and some of the images that I have that I would call uh, the abstract photos that are up on that 500px link are um, particularly they're, they're, they're photos of tire tracks in mud. And I just really like that pattern. Um, let's see here. Where? Oh, where? Nope. These are photos. Your photos. Hmm. Let's see here. Further down. Here we go. So I'm just going to paste these into Slack um, rather than. Um, this is, these are all kind of from a series um, that I was doing, kind of taking a, a sort of more abstract concept of what is a landscape and um, playing our, oh, oh, hold on. Unfortunately, I've been really been meaning to get a, um, a gallery of these all up on my website. It's just I have a I have a kid, <laughs> uh, and so it's difficult. Uh, uh, let's see here. Come on, copy. It. Especially in these times when we don't have any childcare right now, they do not pay preschool teachers and daycare professionals nearly enough. Let's see. These aren't the best photos either. I think most of these are just photos that I took with my phone. Um, 
a few more. I could browse through these for quite a while. The photos in the 500px. Good job. Thanks. Um, I've been yeah, I've been taking photographs for mm, probably 30 years at this point. So you know, here's a here's a long one. So this was this one was actually uh, the one I'm about to paste in the long tall one. It is four feet tall, and um, my uh, my in-laws actually claimed it when my wife and I went to South America for a couple of months, um, and uh, it was actually inspired by Minecraft. Um, I did a whole series in college on um, the idea of what is a landscape uh, by just taking uh, photographs of the, a, a computer screen or a television while playing through video games, first person shooters or driving games or whatnot that I thought had particularly interesting landscapes. And I take pictures of my screens and um, print them out really big um, and present them as uh, artificial landscapes. So yeah, I don't know. Any other questions? You mentioned that these physical ones that you're posting pictures of, these are wax or they're with wax? Yeah, they're, um, it's wax and pigment on, um, on a typically a birch bore that's been reinforced. Um, and for the ones that I do, they, they'll range from like six by six inches up to four by four feet. Um, and I mean, really, I use paint brushes, but typically the way that I work with that is um, I'll have like a um, uh, old like camping burner type of thing um, for uh, for a grill, and I'll just set up little pools of wax and mix, mix pigment in there with brushes. You dab that in little, in small little bits onto the panel, and then fuse it into the rest of the piece with a blowtorch. Um, and then typically use a piece of metal to kind of scrape it back. And there's a lot of um, it, it ties into my other interest of a sort of like back and forth processing of adding chaos and order. Um, and you can kind of see in like in the in the last piece that I have the the blue segments that form what you might consider to be the sky it breaks up and that's where I'm actually like mixing in, deliberately mixing in water into the wax to get a little bit of chaos. And then I dry it out really, really quickly with the blowtorch to just have it kind of blow up. Hey, I had a question. I was looking at your pictures on 500px there. Do you ever try to combine your computer art with your uh, photography? Um, I haven't found a natural fit for that yet. Um, the, in terms of like the, 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 the silver uh, gelatin, uh, well, the, the black and white uh, tire track series um, that I was, uh, that there are some examples of on there. Um, hold on here. See, I can I'll link to an example real quick. Um, I feel those are the closest to that in terms of what they are pictures of, or the kind of like the kind of work that I consider it to be. Oh, this this doesn't include any of the good ones. Oh shoot. Okay. <sighs> I really need to get on uh, updating some of this. Um, like this is one of the links um, for one of those pieces and this is a, a tire track in the snow or a series of tire tracks in the snow where um, it's just a particularly uh, a particular uh, snowy day uh, with the road that had a lot of traffic and there's a lot of back and forth with the tires mushing into the snow and then the snow melting and then more tires and whatnot. Um, I, Snow is pretty rare, so I've all, I also do it in mud. And um, I, oh, oh, here's some of those. Oh, no, these are on Facebook. Okay, um, hold on here. Sorry, photos. There's a couple of these in here that I really like. Um, 
that I've also, I, I, I've done these in, uh, I'll do these on a metallic paper when I print them. Um, the rectangles uh, series that I showed earlier too, um, when I print those, I print those on metallic paper as well. I just really like how it comes out. Um, for, I mean, because these pictures are abstract and don't really have a subject and the composition is oftentimes kind of haphazard and random, um, I view the I view these more as a kind of uh, experience of texture, especially when uh, I have these in black and white. Um, and the way that the uh, the water and the mud and the, the sort of reflectiveness of it all, just I don't know, it 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 really makes me it makes me feel something, and that it it, spe it speaks to what one of the um, people who I took a photography class from in college said, where. Um, if the color doesn't make you feel something, print it in black and white. And if the texture doesn't make you feel something, print it in color. With the unstated assumption that you should kind of focus on one or the other and um, make sure that, that you get something out of one or the other. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there are, uh, hmm. I don't know, it's the sort of thing where maybe like at some point I feel like I could um, load up some of the, maybe this mud photos and pull out little snippets of them and use them as textures and something. At the same time, that also doesn't seem that interesting to me based on my interests of the, the process of construction and reconstruction. I, I feel like, especially looking at, uh, at some of the other people who I follow on Twitter or Instagram or whatnot, um, they're typically just working with with math and color and uh, exploring ideas out of out of algorithms that way um, working with pixels doesn't hold a lot of appeal to me hey Matt Lee you mentioned uh, oh. Synthesizers, uh, what kind of stuff do you play around with? Um, I build a lot of my own in, uh, in Max MSP and Reactor, okay. which um, are both, I, I would call, for people who are unfamiliar with their graphical programming environments, um, for uh, doing effectively audio manipulation. Um, uh, yeah, I also just like, Playing around with, uh, with with samplers and doing uh, field recordings. Um, my son's favorite activity is to go down to uh, West Bay Park down here and throw rocks in the water and uh, take my field recorder with me and get a lot of interesting noise down there and um, load that up in the sampler and play with it. Hmm. Oh. Um, thanks for, for, for coming, joining. I don't know. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Good talk. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is, uh, these, are, these are interesting times. I hope everybody is, uh, is staying healthy um, and sane. <laughs>